Hi friends, how are you all doing? Happy Friday! Another Friends of France Friday. And I cannot believe it. We are in the third to last episode of the third season of the podcast. Wow. It's so bittersweet just thinking about the near end of the season. I am also excited to close this chapter of the show and hopefully await a new phase in the near future. How are you? How are your seasonal allergies? Everyone in my job has been sick with their springtime allergies and I think I'm next. I was walking through Central Park the other weekend and I just saw so many people sneezing. It's definitely those pollens flying around. But that's just one of the things you can see happening at Central Park on any given day. It's truly a garden of wonders, of sights and experiences. I feel like Central Park is one of those places in New York City that I have so many memories of because it's so huge and I visit with different groups of people each time. One of my more recent memories is walking alongside the 5th Avenue side of the park during early December. I was on a date, a second date actually, <laughs> the tea. We spent some time inside the Mint Museum, which is on East 82nd Street, and then we walked all the way to K-Town on 32nd Street for dinner. I literally walked 50 long streets and a couple of avenues with my date, just talking about life and everything. Now, each time I pass by the park while driving by, all I can think is, wow, I can't believe we walked all of those streets. But that's just one of the magic of Central Park for me. But tea aside, Central Park reminds me of one more thing, nursing school. During my first semester of nursing school, or my fundamentals of nursing class, my first ever clinical rotation was in a nursing home on the Upper East Side also along the 5th Avenue side of the park. I remember walking by the park to get to the facility, where I would then spend 8-10 to 10 hours taking care of the nursing home residents. This really opened my eyes to the world of nursing, which I had never thought of before. Growing up with my mom, who was a hospital nurse herself, I think I somewhat glamorized the nursing profession I had in mind. Procedures, injections, anesthesia, codes, always pleasant patients. I never really saw the patient bed baths and tracheostomy care and turning patients and ulcers and poop and peas and making beds and this is all that we did in the nursing home rotation. I just remember the bed bound geriatric patients, mostly in their 70s through 90s, who we had to turn every two hours so they would avoid pressure ulcers. However, the one clinical rotation memory I will never forget is a resident in her late 80s. I remember knocking on her door and she was just sitting down in her chair and looking out the window while eating a pudding. Hi, I said. How's your morning? I'm just here waiting, I remember her saying. Waiting for who? I asked. Someone to visit me, she said. My son hasn't visited me for a few years. Can you be my son while you're here? She asked me. I remember my heart sinking. And this is the situation of many of the residents in that nursing home and nursing homes in general. For whatever reason unknown to us, the residents were rarely, if at all, visited by their families or loved ones. One of the nurses told us that sometimes, the nursing staff is all these residents have because they have been abandoned by their families. According to the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, nearly one-fourth of older adults aged 65 and older are at increased risk for loneliness and are considered to be socially isolated, with risk factors being attributed to losing family or friends, hearing loss, role changes such as retirement, living alone, and chronic disease. When it comes to older adults, I have a very touchy part in my heart because I grew up with my grandma, who stayed with us here in New York before moving back to Asia when I started high school. Because my mom was a single mom and a night shift nurse for most of my childhood, my grandma took care of me most of the time. Walked me to school, made my lunch, took me up from school, took me to piano lessons and Kumon tutoring. Ugh, the Asian PTSD. Who can relate? And to think that there are grandmas and grandpas out there who are just looking at a window somewhere and waiting for their loved ones because they think they have been abandoned, my heart can't fully take that thought. The field of geriatric medicine is truly one that is beyond the scientific and the clinical. It is the emotional and the mental. Beyond finding the empirical solutions to geriatric syndromes that most older adults face, such as malnutrition, cognitive impairment like dementia, polypharmacy, false inferiority, and of the like, the mental and emotional tolls of living in spite of chronic disease, battling loneliness and depression, and maximizing quality of life despite these hurdles are the crux of the field. And for this topic, 
I am beyond honored to be joined today by double board certified internist and geriatrician from Mayo Clinic, Dr. Christina Chen. Dr. Chen currently stands as an attending geriatrician and assistant professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic Rochester, the host of the Aging Forward podcast, the course director of the Mayo Clinic Alex School of Medicine Senior Sages Curriculum, and the Medical Advisory Board of GrandPad, a customizable platform that delivers virtual care to seniors at home while keeping seniors connected to reduce social isolation and improve the telehealth experience. This is such a personal topic for me, and I hope you get to learn a lot, just as I did. Hi, Doc. Hey, how are you doing? Christian. Thank you so, so much Good, for joining me tonight. Yeah, thanks for the invite. Love so it. honored to have you <laughs> on tonight. I've been actually wanting to invite you to our podcast episode for such a long time now, for several months now, and it's finally here. If you could just first please introduce yourself to our future podcast listeners, please, and thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Christina Chen. I am a geriatrician. I practice at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Lived here for about 11 years, trained here for fellowship. Prior to that, I trained in Illinois for residency, mm. and I'm originally from Michigan, where I lived for 20-something years. I, I forget now, but yeah, I've been here for a while, and I think mm. we're here to stay. So we have a family, two kids, uh, <laughs> oh my God. Two chickens that I recently got, uh, two birds. So we're kind of settling in our roots. Our, our, yeah, uh, I love it. The family is here I, to stay, probably. I love so. the chickens. Yeah. <laughs> That's so good here. I mean... I've been wanting to speak to Jerry Trishan for such a while now because it holds such a dear place in my heart. My first rotation in nursing school was in the nursing home. And that was the first time I was yeah. like, oh, this is such a very niche field too. Right? I mean, I grew up also with my grandma who took care of me. So I grew up with a single mom who was working all the time as a nurse too. So my grandma took care of me growing up. So I feel like I've always had this deep love and appreciation for her elderly. And I'm like, we need a whole podcast episode on all of the changes and all of the things that make the field of geriatrics special. And again, I'm so honored that it's you who's with me tonight in this episode. I first wanted to do a deep dive into your journey into medicine. I mean, you know, it's a long road yeah. getting to where you are now as a physician. I want to know what's your first inspiration in becoming a physician, entering the field of medicine. Is it a family, friend, or a personal experience? Yeah, I, so I've always grown up in a very scientific family. You know, my father worked in various aspects of, of science. So he was a biochemist. He taught parasitology, chemistry at Michigan State University. So I spent my life like in, in the lab all the time. I would always go to work with him. I dissected my first mouse at the age of five. So I just loved anatomy, physiology, and was always immersed in science. And I just loved that growing up in, in high school and in and college. But I feel like the geriatric aspect really came from my just being raised by my grandmother. So my grandmother came to the States when I was young and to, to help take care of me. And so she was like my, my mentor, you know, she ended up passing away at age 99. But I always saw her as my, she was my hero and she was like invincible to me. She didn't have a single health issue, was cognitively intact until the day that she passed away. And so I just, I really saw her as my role model. And I, I always hung out with old people as well. Even at, you know, parties, you know, all the kids would be playing with all their kids. And I would just find that like, you know, lonely older adult and just sit with them and learn from them. So I think I just had a heart for people mm -hmm. who, were more, I don't know, more vulnerable maybe and just needed a listening ear. So combining science as a love with older adults as, you know, mentorship and just people that I love to be with, um, it just made sense to. Yeah. to uh, so would you say that field. you pursued yeah. medicine even more because, you know, you wanted to be a geriatrician? Like from the get-go, did you know you wanted to work with older people? I didn't know geriatrics was a subspecialty until residency and, and so I went through the whole exploration mm -hmm. phase I really loved cardiology too the, the physiology of the heart I love GI and so I explored all of that and then it wasn't until I went through a, a geriatric rotation where I was like wow this is this is actually a field and just fell in love with that aspect of not just handling chronic disease but mm -hmm. handling the life life journey of, of people throughout their health spectrum and I, I found that it was a combination of internal medicine that everything that I loved plus 
population that I love. So yeah, and I think that's the the main mm-hmm. challenge is most people are not exposed yeah. to geriatrics until you know mm-hmm. it wasn't until recently that medical school has more of a integrated or, or needed curriculum for most most medical schools. Prior to that, there wasn't a lot of dedicated curriculum for geriatric training. So things are changing now, but I I, I think it might be a little bit yeah. Late, I mean, better late. I know that you also yeah. are like. The course director, right, at Mayo Clinic for the Sages curriculum, and I guess you know, like really yeah. contributing to yeah. this push for really learning more about the geriatric population, right? Mm-hmm. I think the early mm. exposure experience is so important. The earlier, the better. We just mm. had a Senior Sage initial kickoff event, which is where our students, our first year students, are matched with a senior in the community, and they kind of learn from each other over the course of four years that the students are there training and they learn about geriatric medicine through the eyes of someone who's going through that experience. So it's like a relationship that they build over four years, but also um, just a really unique and creative yeah. way of learning I lo- uh, geriatric yeah, medicine. I love that so much. I mean, program. I truly believe that the early exposure is so integral, right? To, I guess, even just developing like a baseline respect, right? Especially in a world where life of knowledge is real and ageism is real too, right? In the society. So, well, I guess, as you take mm-hmm. a deep dive into the whole field of geriatrics, geriatric medicine, for the only person who may not even know what the word geriatrics means, right? As the expert here, as the attendant sure. here, what is the field of geriatrics all about? What is the premise of the whole field? And I guess, what is the demarcation line between regular adult medicine and geriatric medicine? Mm-hmm. Yeah, good question. So think of geriatrics as the mm-hmm. opposite of mm-hmm. pediatrics. You know, pediatrics would take care of kids geriatrics, older adults. And the reason is because the the human body changes over time. The, the way that we treat children is completely different than the way that we manage the general adult population, which is different than, than the older adult population. So the health needs change over time. And the, the age right cutoff right now is 65. 65 and above is considered geriatric or older adult. But I would argue that there's a lot of 65-year-olds that are actually quite healthy without any health issues and very robust. And so that line is sort of a little bit muddy there, but it's right now by definition 65 and above. And our focus is a lot of different things. Our focus is not just prevention of disease. It's not just, you know, diagnosing disease, but we're also handling a lot of the the sequelae or the outcome of living with long-term disease. And in, in many situations, people are living with more functional impairment with cognitive impairment and the the outcome of just living with say diabetes or heart failure or, or COPD for a long time, which impacts their ability to stay independent. So our goal is not just managing those specific health issues, but how do we help them live well despite living with disease? And it's it's a challenge because in this day and age of modern medicine where everything is supposedly treatable, right? We have we have a treatment for everything. We've got a way to like cure disease and reverse disease. And it's hard to have that perception change of, okay, at some point we have to realize that, you know, we're living with this and there's no reversal. And at some point, you know, it might affect our quality of life and function and helping people not just adapt to that, but thrive in that environment so that they feel empowered to continue to live well, despite what they are diagnosed with is kind of the the art of geriatric medicine Mm -hmm. that I've really grown to love. So I think there's a lot of ways you can weave in geriatric medicine to other subspecialties. Like not everyone is meant to be a geriatrician. I mean, we need cardiologists and we need gastroenterologists, but how do we weave in geriatric concepts so that yes, you're seeing this person for for heart disease, but also understanding Mm -hmm. how is this impacting their function or their quality of life so that we're also managing their yeah, um, health got conditions it. in a more so beautiful way. and i think speaking yeah. also like interweaving geriatric medicine and i guess the care for in different specialties as well i think it's also true that there's geriatrics everywhere right in different settings so i guess the next question would be mm-hmm. as a geriatrician where are the places we would see geriatricians right i guess in what settings does the specialty usually work in is it just the hospitals just clinic oh everywhere it's such a versatile field. You, you can work in the inpatient setting. You can work in the clinical outpatient setting and have your own patient panel. A lot of geriatricians work in long-term care settings. So in nursing homes, they can be medical directors of nursing homes. Academic medicine, you know, you can do teaching. So my practice is a blend of all of that. I do a little bit of everything. I, I have my own clinical practice, but I also 
I work in the nursing homes one day a week. I don't do inpatient medicine, but I did that for a little bit during my first part of my career. I also do a little bit of integrated medicine too. So you can you can really become creative. So I, I trained in acupuncture with the goal of helping older adults live better with their pain experience and just integrating that into their care. So you can get really creative and it makes each day fun because you're not just doing the same thing over and over, right? Each day is a little bit different. And I also have the honor of working with our medical students mm -hmm. too, who are just amazing and they they're so willing to learn and so um, enthusiastic uh, to learn about you know geriatric medicine so it's it's a lot of teaching learning along the way and, and practice and it's, it makes yeah, it I love this, um, that and I guess I want to talk more also about I guess the bread and butter of your work like on the daily I guess how does the usual day of work look like and I guess what would be the reasons for the elderly that you're seeing under your service right why are they there usually most of the time like bread and butter diagnoses and such. So it depends on which setting you work in. So for example, in my outpatient practice, I, I see a lot of general chronic disease management. And it's not just managing their pre-existing disease. A lot of times we're diagnosing new conditions as well. It's very versatile. We see a lot of cognitive impairment and new diagnosis of, of dementias, which can be hard for the families and caregivers because it's, it's really a journey. And so helping them go through that journey is a, is a common thing that we we do in our practice. In the nursing home is different because these nursing home patients have been living there for many years, or they may be in the rehab setting where they're recovering from a recent illness. And so we, we do admissions there, we help them transition safely back home, or we see them if they are there long term, we see them routinely as almost like primary care visits to make sure that they're doing well. And so each practice is a little bit different, but the bread and butter is Again, helping people live well despite their current situation and how do we mm -hmm. still find ways to improve their quality of life, even if it seems like things are hopeless or that they don't have much time left. I, I just feel so badly when when that general perception of geriatric medicine is that, you know, it, it seems like a hopeless situation, right? It just it seems like what else can we do for them? But there's there's so much we can still do for them because I think every life is so important and, and their dignity needs to be preserved and to approach each patient case in that manner. Ever since I was a child, my inner arms and neck would always suffer from itchiness and irritation whenever I would sweat. It can become so debilitating, forcing myself not to scratch my skin and end up with wounds from prickly heat, especially at night. Thankfully, I have found relief through By Dr. Mom's Soothing Beta Cream and Soothing Bad Treatment, which uses barley-derived beta-glucan technology to help alleviate eczema, bug bites, and dry, itchy, irritated skin. Beta-glucan is a fiber shown in scientific studies to improve skin hydration and healing, and By Dr. Mom's products extract it with a technique that uses air technology, requiring no chemicals or solvents. Created by family physician Dr. Stephanie Liu with the help of an allergist and immunologist, you can now allow your skin to breathe and heal naturally. Using the code CHRISTIAN10, that's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N-1-0, you can get 10% off your first order on buydoctormom.com. As a healthcare worker, my identity can become so boxed within the pressures and expectations of my profession that sometimes I forget who I really am outside the hospital walls. This is why I find so much power and liberation in self-expression through fashion and accessories and Lupin seeks to do the same. Encouraging self-confidence and creating a safe space to be yourself, Lupin seeks to share with the world simple and impactful jewelry pieces that can bring confidence effortlessly. Meaning what goes around comes around, the brand, comprised of third-generation jewelers, holds a mission to brighten the community by promoting positivity and a growth mindset. Lupin's clean designs are handcrafted in South Korea using 925 sterling silver, and can go with almost any outfit on anyone. In fact, I wear my pieces on and off shift. With the code FRANZ, that's F-R-A-N-Z, you can get 15% off your first order on lupin.com. Let's bring more luster into the world, together with Lupin. I remember coming home every day from elementary school and smelling the newly steamed jasmine rice in the cooker that my grandmother made just in time for dinner. It reminded me of my first few years living on the farm back home in Asia, sniffing the rice while overlooking the fields. Found in 2020, Bison Candle Co. hand pours nostalgic and iconic scented soy wax candles inspired by the Asian scents, flavors, and traditions 
that founder Brandon Leung grew up with in his first-generation Chinese-American household. Brandon's mission with Baisan is to create authentic Asian aromas while rediscovering his love of his Chinese culture and heritage. The candles and home fragrances celebrate aromatic Eastern flavors and aromas one would typically find in an Asian kitchen or pantry, like Vietnamese coffee, steamed white rice, and white peach. Enjoy traditional scents alongside some modern spin-off blends and be taken back into the beauty of the motherland with the code Baisan Franz, that's B-A-I-S-U-N, F-R-A-N-Z for 15% off your first order at bisoncandleco.com. I think before we even deep dive into some of those problems that you mentioned and those chronic diseases, I think all of these terms that you just said, I think the general public can envelop it in the word of aging, right? Like, oh, that's common or that's normal that's expected because as people age that 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 right so i mm-hmm. guess as someone who sees aging as a progressive thing as a progression thing as, as a geriatrician to you what does aging actually mean what does it mean that oh i'm of old age now right and so that notes as you see a lot of I guess diseases and all of that is there such thing as healthy aging is there such thing as, even if I'm 80 years old, I can still be considered as a healthy aged person? Absolutely. I see tons of 80 and 90 year olds still out there like, <laughs> oh jet skiing and, you know, enjoying their lives to the max. And I'm just, I sometimes I'm jealous because I'm like, wow, you loving are life. rocking it. You are just <laughs> loving life. That's, that's amazing. But, you know, we are aging as soon as we're born. Honestly, that, that's the reality. As soon as we're born, yes, we're we're growing, and but our cells are aging. It's a physiologic, you know, biologic change that just happens with time. There's nothing we can do about it, unfortunately. And every part of our organ ages, and people age in different ways. Some people may have the chronologic age mm-hmm. may be different than biologic age, meaning that some people may age better than others. You know, you often see these. 80 year olds who you're like, wow, they don't look like they're 80 because they're so functional and they're still bright and, you know, cognitively intact and just doing so much. And then you'll see 60 year olds who are completely debilitated in wheelchairs mm-hmm. and can't, can't take care of themselves. So it's, it's such a wide spectrum. And to your and answer to your question about healthy aging, I, I think that is really mm-hmm. up to how people perceive aging to be for them. Healthy aging doesn't mean to be completely absent of disease, because I don't think that's completely possible, right? We're all bound to develop arthritis at some point in our lives. I, mm-hmm. I mean, I probably already, I, I have arthritis. I, I, can, I can tell you that for a certainty. Um, we, we're all going to start to wrinkle. And so these are all things that are expected. But how, how do we approach the aging process and living with chronic disease? Like I said, it's, you know, it can either be a very hard process or we can find ways to develop that resiliency. And despite living with a history of stroke or diabetes or, you know, heart failure, there are still ways that we can go through life in a meaningful way and to set those goals for ourselves. And that's the, that's what we, I try to really coach my patients to discover for themselves is uh, despite your current situation, what does healthy aging mean to you? What are you still looking forward to doing? And how can we get you there without feeling like just throwing our hands up to say, okay, there's there's not much else that we can do? Because my my mantra is there's always something we can do for each patient. You yeah. just have to kind of get a little bit creative and discover what their goals are and what their aspirations are and how, how do we get them there? Yeah. Even if it's more, definitely. Months, and I think that's why they always time. say, right? Like medicine is a science and art, right? We have all of those logistical right. things, like textbook right. things and things that's obviously evidence-based and on the data, on the dot. And then there's things like just outside of the box that you think of that are creative. And I think like yeah. even like EQ Absolutely. over IQ too, right? And how we relate to the patients and how we interweave because their emotions and how their culture may be into the care that they receive, right? And you also mentioned a lot about, you know, the idea of disease and the aging process. I guess throughout the years that you've been practicing now, would you say that there are diseases that are just expected or just people are just prone to throughout the aging process? I guess as we reach that line of 
I guess, geriatrics, the, the age that we consider as geriatric. Can you say that there are diseases that, not that they're not preventable, but you would expect that, oh, by the time we reach this age, we'd probably have this. Yeah, you know, that that's a hard question um, because I, I think it's a combination mm-hmm. of things. You know, genes play a big part into that, our environment, um, our, our habits. And so I think, I mean, the physiologic changes are, are for sure where, you know, things are going to degenerate. We lose about a third of our nephrons over our lifetime. So we're bound to have a little bit of at least slowing of our renal capacity and uh, filtration. We, you know, we're all bound to develop a little bit of arthritis, I think, you know, so these things are probably expected just from the biologic changes. And then everything else compounds on top of that. If you lived a life of high stress and you, you're prone to hypertension if your genetics um, put you at risk of heart disease. I mean, that all impacts how things sort of develop and progress. And then it's just sort of the outcome of that. And some people may have high risk, but then they live a healthy life and they don't develop any of these things. So it's, it's really hard to predict for each person. That's why there's so much variety. There's such a huge spectrum of how people oh, age. And so I don't know if I'm answering your question but I don't. I don't think mm-hmm. we're expected to develop anything at a, at a certain time. I think there's a lot of yeah. different yeah. variables. Yeah, and I guess as opposed to, to just expected diseases, I think there are just also just experiences that I guess are experienced more by the geriatric population. And we're also working in the nursing home, and I have rotated through it. And I actually asked mm-hmm. uh, followers to send in words or even medical concepts that they think of when they hear the word the elderly or Jerry. So I'm going to say a few, and I guess for each one, I wonder what your approach is as a geriatrician, right? And also maybe a general term that's so easy to understand, but I guess from your point of view, what do you think it is? And I think the first one that came a lot is the concept of frailty and falls. Um, As a geriatrician, what does that mean to you? And are the elderly more prone to falls, really? And um, what is your approach for that? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're hitting all the, the big the big topics here. And, you know, frailty and falls is like, they're both like two huge <laughs> lectures in itself that I could, I could go on and on forever about. But I, I saw the list that you mentioned. I'm just like, wow, Christian really did his homework because this is like, this is like the bread and butter of geriatrics, mm-hmm. you know, frailty and falls. And I'm just sort of going to lump them together. Mm-hmm. You mentioned urinary incontinence, osteoporosis, malnutrition, and uh, Alzheimer's dementias. And everything that you listed fall into the category mm-hmm. of what we call geriatric syndromes. And what that, that means is a syndrome is a, it comes from Greek roots, dromos meaning running together. And so it's basically things that happen over and over in sequence in a pattern not specifically a disease you know entity it's not like diabetes or hypertension but it's a, a pattern that happens over and over specifically in older adults so for example how come christian you don't fall every day right how come you don't have your incontinence <laughs> at least i hope you don't have your incontinence you know and why, why do these things happen just in older adults and it's because it's a combination of things where if you combine biological changes in our body on top of other issues like the impact of chronic disease, on top of being on medications for so many years, and then polypharmacy, and then being more prone to like dehydration or sepsis and illness. In combination, if you if if that all um, happens at the same time, it puts people at higher risk of developing things like falls. Right? If you're on ten medications, plus you have arthritis and you've got a little bit of dementia. And perhaps you had a stroke, you know, years ago. It affects your balance. It affects your, your sensory perception. It affects your ability to maneuver uh, complex paths, and so you're just prone to falling. Similar to frailty, it's a it's a phenotype that is characterized by five major phenotypes: loss, you know, the subjective sense of, of weakness or reduced strength, weight loss, exhaustion, and so these are all kind of similar symptoms or syndromes that seem to occur in older adults who are prone to that phenotype and put them puts them at higher risk because they're just more vulnerable to begin with. And so you can stick any geriatric syndrome, any word in that like in that category, 
And the the learning point here for all, all students or, or residents or whoever's in, in, in training, if you see a geriatric syndrome, it can be anything, think of it as there's probably more than one thing going on. And so always explore more than just one thing. If they come in where they fall, it's not just a mechanical fall that they tripped over a stool. Look into a little bit deeper. What meds are they on? How long have they lived with you know, arthritis, if there, is there pain affecting their joints that could be impacting their balance? Are they using a walker safely? You know, what's their environment like? Are they living in this dark home with like numerous stairs and trip hazards? So all these things, you know, in combination puts people at higher risk of these, these syndromes. So in a nutshell, if you're seeing any of these issues, try to look at at least a couple different avenues a couple different pillars of care to see what are some of these risks and what can we do to mitigate some of these risks because all you have to do is maybe address two or three of them and it can make a huge impact on one's fall risk or frailty risk so that they're not at um, risk of having that happen again or having long-term outcomes from that so we again we can go through each like health condition (laughs) separately but and i'm happy to do more lives Mm -hmm. to to talk about you know our mental health and, and dementia care and weight loss i mean those are yeah, well, I think big topics the one to I think, off the um, list i think yeah. the one that i really want to talk about is dementia and alzheimer's disease mm-hmm. i don't know if you've seen the movie the notebook yes. um nicholas sparks and i have I watching yeah. this kid um seeing the ending where i guess the other forgot who their children were and then they were sundowning and i think as a kid mm-hmm. i was like Oh my gosh, this is going to happen to my grandma as well. Uh, well, my grandma actually has Alzheimer's now and doesn't remember me or, or her children. Oh, right? I'm um, sorry about that. I guess if mm. I can't imagine how often <laughs> you see this in practice, right? And I think of the list, this is the one that I really yeah. wanted yeah. to, I guess, switch your brains about is what is dementia? What is Alzheimer's? Are they the same thing? Is it just I think when people mostly think about dementia Alzheimer's, they mostly think of memory loss. But obviously, mm-hmm. I'm reading about it mm-hmm. and studying about it in school. I'm just like, okay, it's not just memory loss. It's like a whole cascade of different things. What is Alzheimer's? What, what is mm-hmm. dementia? Mm-hmm. Yeah, good question. And it's funny you mentioned this because I just did a, oh, wow. a podcast on this um, yesterday uh, for our AZ Ford podcast. So that'll be coming out hopefully next week. But um, it's a good talk, Dr. Tung, Erica Tung, who's kind of our dementia expert um, is our speaker so but i can give a summary so dementia is kind of an umbrella term that describes memory impairment and it can be caused by numerous causes but memory impairment that is significant enough to impact one's ability to function independently so we all have some degree of memory loss i mean i i forget what i eat this morning for breakfast, right? And I always lose my keys, but those are like brain lapses that we all go through. But dementia is memory loss plus some deficit of a cognitive domain, whether it's learning or language or executive function that is severe enough to impact their ability to live independently and thrive in the community. And so dementia is that umbrella term. Alzheimer's is a type of dementia. It's one of the causes of dementia. There's many other causes of dementia as well. So for example, uh, Lewy body dementia is also, is probably the second most common now. Vascular dementia is when people have a history of multiple strokes and each time they've had a stroke, you know, parts of their brain dies and becomes scarred and doesn't work as well. Parkinson's disease, a lot of people in late stage disease can develop dementia. And then you've got like the really more rare, I suppose, like NPH and so forth in the other degenerative processes, but but all of that can lead to a global loss of cognitive function severe enough to impact their ability to, to function. And so, you know, as we talk about Alzheimer's is the most common type, it, it's about two thirds of the dementia prevalence. And it's very devastating. I mean, it's a very slow, progressive process. It can happen over many years, sometimes over a decade before it's even diagnosed because the the changes can be so subtle before it's like, hey, something's not right with mom, you know, she all of a sudden just can't find her way back home. And it's like, that's, you know, that is concerning. Um, But sometimes these, the diagnosis can be delayed because people can can live with it and they can kind of, you know, get by living with it and, and, and others don't notice. 
wooey body is a little bit more dramatic. It, people tend to have more like hallucinations and delusions and have just like the uh, perceptual changes, changes in sensorium. And so that can be very distressing. Mm-hmm. And so each dementia type has its own features, but overall bottom line is that it becomes progressive to a point where people just can't handle day-to-day cares anymore. Mm-hmm. So that's where it becomes hard to live on their own. And then, then we're talking about where do we, where do we go from there? We, how do we support them? In this world of social media that places so much physical critique and pressure and maintaining a youthful appearance against all environmental odds, the skincare and beauty industries have succumbed to a myriad of anti-aging practices. However, the covert fact is that beauty is timeless and that aging is a privilege. Regents, an inclusive wellness brand, seeks to promote this ritual of well-aging, understanding that it is connectivity with the body and attentive care given to it as it changes including our skin. Founded by Filipino-American Giulio Rizio, Regents introduces the all-encompassing serum, created to target the concerns of maturing melanated skin by utilizing a blend of healing botanicals used by our ancestors and select clinically proven active ingredients. From the brightening Ayurvedic licorice root to the soothing Centella Asiatica and hydrating green algae, welcome to the journey of fueling skin health and enhancing not changing your natural shade. With the code FRANZ, that's F-R-A-N-Z, you can get 15% off your first order on regionswellness.com. Experience the power of mixing native wisdom with modern day science. Do you have any guilty pleasures? I have one, boba. Given that the average cafe made milk tea has over 100 calories per serving, over 20 grams of high glycemic sugar, and is packed with artificial flavors, I am so glad that the guilty days are over with Twirl, the world's first canned plant-based milk tea. With only 45 to 50 calories per serving and containing 6 to 7 grams of low glycemic sweeteners, Twirl is made with pea milk, the most sustainable plant-based milk on the market, regenerating the soil where it comes from. Fair trade and organic are the names of the game as the teas are sourced from biodiverse family farms in China, Japan, and Taiwan that practice sustainable farming techniques. No artificial flavors are ever used. From four different flavors to ready-to-eat plant-based konjac and boba pearls, let's enjoy tasty, creamy, shelf-stable, and healthy milk tea together for 10% off using the code FRANZ10, that's F-R-A-N-Z-1-0, on twirlmilktea.com. Twirl around in its goodness. Growing up, I was ashamed of my Asian heritage. Classmates would comment about the lunch my grandma cooked, Other kids would make fun of my eyes, and even some adults today would tell me to go back to where I came from. But where do I really belong? Who really am I? Am I not American enough? Highlighting the year of the first documented arrival of Asian Americans in North America, 1587 Sneakers seeks to shine the spotlight on Asian American stories and demonstrate to the world the extraordinary breadth of our passions and achievements. Made with full grain natural Italian leather by Fowey Artisans, 100% biodegradable natural rubber outsole, calf leather interior lining for comfort and good smells, and waxed cotton laces for longer lasting cleanliness. These premium sneakers combine the highest quality, an array of timeless designs, and the movement to be authentically who you are. With the code FRANZ15, that's lowercase f-r-a-n-z-1-5, you can get 15% off your first order on 1587sneakers.com. Step into embracing your identity without hiding. Express yourself, unapologetically. All this, like, just the quality of life, right? And I think that's also tied to a lot of, I guess, mental health in the elderly, right? Like, the feeling of, oh, I can't do the things I used Mm -hmm. to be able to do anymore, or I can't. I can't do the simple right. task that I used to be for the people around me or for myself. And I guess even as we mentioned the age of 65, right? Even like retirement, it's like, oh, what do I do with my life now? Right? <laughs> like, um, I'm in a different role or season mm-hmm. in life than I was before. Like, I remember my mom actually just, just retired. She, she's 65, now turning 66. And I remember when she, after she retired, she, she's been retirement from nursing. She's been a nurse for decades now. She's just like, I don't know what to do with my life anymore. Like, I don't know what to do next. And I feel like yeah, these right. are um, 
things that we, I guess we don't really think about until we get to that point, right? Like the concept of mental health, mm-hmm. especially for the elderly. And it's very interesting because I guess there are pains like a fall where the person who fell can feel it, right? Or wounds that we can see. But I feel like there's some wounds, there's some injuries that are invisible to everybody, right? And I feel like those kind of wounds, especially mm, the elderly, yeah. are, I guess, the wounds of, like, loneliness and maybe abandonment. I, I remember, um, I'll never forget, uh, I was a first-year nursing student. We were at a uh, nursing home in the city, and I, I, I sat to one of the residents during their lunchtime, and she was like, you know, my, my children haven't visited me for four years now. She's like, can you be... Can you be my son um, while we're having Aww. lunch? And in my mind, I was like, it's like Aww. loneliness Aww. and abandonment and the feeling like loss of, yeah. I guess, autonomy and just control of your life is such a real thing, especially in the geriatric population. As the geriatrician, the physician yeah. who sees this and obviously you make the executive decisions for this age population mm-hmm. beyond the textbook for physical manifestations of aging and disease how do you deal with things that are unseen and maybe invisible like loneliness and heartbreak and fear of the remaining future yeah boy that's a that's a loaded question um i i share your Mm -hmm. sentiment about the nursing home experience because uh I, I hate using the word sad, but I, I can't help but just feel like my my heart aches every time I go into a nursing home and I just see people sitting there by themselves, they're eating by themselves. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure their families have visited, but you know, you sort of see people in their empty shell of who they were before. And it's it's not uncommon that people are depressed and, and lonely and anxious because they just don't have that stimulation. And so I guess a, a broad way to answer your question is that I think we have to remember that despite what people look like to us on the surface, they may look older and, and frail and helpless in many ways, but they still are people, right? They still are valuable and their legacy deserves to be preserved. They were functioning people at some point in their lives. They contributed to society. They were scientists and artists and teachers and engineers. I mean, they were, they are human and they have families, they have people who love them. And it's hard to see that when you meet them for the first time. And um, it's even harder when they can't talk back to you. Right? you can't, they can't like share some of their experiences with you, especially if they're, they're um, if they've got advanced dementia. So, I, I I see what you're saying. It's 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 really hard to um, help people who are already feeling lonely, and that's why whenever I see older adults in the nursing home, I always just spend a little bit more time with them. I you know if they're in the dining room, I might just sit there and just share a meal with them and chat with them a little bit and just hear about their life story. And they may not remember who I am, but they will remember that someone was there to listen to them. And I always try to weave in their family members back into the picture in some way, whether it's just to call them for an update to say, Hey mom, I saw mom today. She's doing well. You know, she would really enjoy your company. And you know, uh, if there's any ways of, of just staying more connected, I think, she would really appreciate it and just try to find ways of bringing families back, especially if I feel like they haven't been visiting much. And so these unseen things are usually years of accumulated sort of deficits of just feeling like you, you've, you've lost so much along the way. And that's what I've been trying to change is it doesn't have to feel like loss along the way. Retirement is funny that you mentioned that retirement feels like a big loss for people because all of a sudden, (laughs) <laughs> you, you know, the first two months are great. You're like, yeah, yeah, I don't have to work anymore. Yeah. You know, I can go read books and do things. But humans are made mm-hmm. to have purpose. And it's the reason why mm-hmm. retirement is actually one of the top 10 stressors of life. People don't realize that, but it's actually a stressful experience. You don't prepare for it. All of a sudden, you have nothing to do. And then that can be a trigger to actually a stressful transition into what your next chapter of life. And so finding those transition points that could trigger depression and anxiety or loneliness and and helping people 
make those transitions a little bit earlier or living with chronic disease uh, in a more meaningful way so that they still feel like they have things to look forward to and things to do. I, I think the earlier we tackle these mm-hmm. things along the way, it, it doesn't accumulate as much to the point where all of a sudden it's just so devastating that you can't do anything, right? It's learning how to be able to do more with less, if that's the best way to describe it. And I feel like I've gone off on a completely different tangent, but tackling loneliness as a whole, depression triggers, but also I think depression, loneliness, and kind of neglect in the nursing home is a completely separate issue that if we just Mm -hmm. remember, everyone is human and we, they all deserve our time, attention, and, you know, yeah. Oh, uh, this is making me teary eyed. <laughs> I mean, it's such a yeah, it, yeah. Like so many people need care, right? Especially within the geriatric population. But aren't there enough people to care yeah. for them, right? And I'm tying this to the statistic that says that yeah. there are approximately seven thousand geriatricians nationally only, and we need about thirty thousand more by twenty thirty to meet the needs of the aging population. The crisis is the crisis. Crazy. Who will care? It's, there will always be it, a geriatrician. It is. Everyone will age and everyone will old. As a physician, mm-hmm. as a geriatrician, mm-hmm. how would you encourage future physicians to enter this field of geriatrics and be the guiding light for our future elderly populations? Yeah. Well, and mm-hmm. this is not just for mm-hmm. physicians. It's for all care providers who take care of patients, mm-hmm. you know, um, mm-hmm. PAs, NPs, nursing, it's, it's just that there is a, there is a heart for geriatrics for everyone. And I would say that, first of all, it's just such a rewarding feel. I don't think people really know about geriatrics because it's not, it's not glamorous. You know, it's not like plastic surgery or trauma surgery or something cool. It's, you know, anesthesia. This is like, I feel like those are the hot specialties and they're all great. I'm, I'm not downplaying them at all. They're all fantastic. But I think geriatrics is sort of buried a little bit because it's not something that's talked about much like i didn't even hear about until residency and so i I think there just needs to be number one more awareness more mentorship more inspirational i guess moments where people can experience like Mm -hmm. taking care of an older adult is such a rewarding rewarding opportunity to be able to make meaningful changes in their lives and to be part of that health journey with them i think the earlier exposure the the better you know so our medical students they're exposed on day one and I feel like they graduate as just really well-rounded physicians because they understand geriatric medicine very well. You know, as, as we're learning about different aspects of, of medicine and you go through different rotations, we're also exposing our students to, to elements of geriatric medicine and those rotational experiences. So, for example, perioperative medicine and surgery, they learn about how to do a perioperative examination, how do we do a geriatric assessment so that we can prevent delirium, risk of delirium uh, as an outcome. And so early education, good mentorship, and just like this is such an underserved field, helping people understand that there's a lot you can do within that field. It's not just seeing patients in nursing homes. You can be an educator. You can be an academic medicine. You can you can be a medical director. You can innovate. There's a lot of innovation in healthy aging and the healthy aging. Research so too. That's kind of what I'm involved with it as well. Research, tons. Tons of research, yeah. As, research is especially mm-hmm. important because a lot of older adults are kind of excluded mm-hmm. from from major research studies, and so we need a lot more research in that area. So there's a lot of exciting things in geriatric medicine, and I think it's just uh, off to the side. Geriatric geriatricians are probably the happiest people, just because I think we we really enjoy what we do, and it's mm-hmm. it's not. Mm-hmm. There's always stressful mm-hmm. parts to every specialty, you know. But it's I feel like the stress. Is, is not something that impacts me negatively. It's, mm-hmm. it's really helping my patients. Um, my <laughs> patient's stress becomes my stress in some ways because I want them to, to uh, mm-hmm. you know, understand how to just mm-hmm. live better. But guiding them through that journey, I think, is part of the reward. And then I would also say that not everyone is meant to be a geriatrician. Obviously, if you, you've got interest to be a pediatrician or um, OB or a surgeon, that's, that's awesome. My goal is that, you know, we can't, we probably can't get 30,000 geriatricians by 2050 or whatever. But if every person in their specialty can be a mini geriatrician in some ways where they have some understanding of how to weave in some of these elements into their practice, I, I think that's a, that's a great win as well, that you don't have to be a full on, you know, 
full blown geriatrician, but you can be a cardiologist with geriatric understanding or a surgeon who knows, okay, this is what I need to do to prevent delirium as an outcome. So just having those elements within your practice, I think is, 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 yeah, a, I love that. is an opportunity and I guess as well. I've learned yeah. so much today and we've talked a lot. And I think a lot of our conversations, not just educational, but we talk a lot about the care team that takes care of Georgia. Well, I guess one of my last questions would be, what would be your message for the geriatric population itself? In the midst of whoever hmm. probably stumble upon this someday, I don't know, someone who just retired and feeling lost in life, or someone who's listening to the podcast episodes on the air in their 70s or 80s and they live alone, what would be your message as a geriatrician to our elderly population? Or, or something that you may want to say to the geriatric population, even though they may no longer remember what you say. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so a common thing that older adults always tell me is like, they, they always use the same phrase. It's like, oh, getting old stinks. It, it really sucks. Like, don't look forward to getting old because the golden years are not golden. <laughs> and I think that's, that's really sad to, to just hear them say that because I think there is a way that we can always look forward to living well and that would be my just global answer to them is there's there's always a way to live well no matter what situation and or circumstance that you're in it may seem the situation may seem grim you may be experiencing a lot of symptoms you, your, your health may be not doing well but you have a medical team you have a partnership with myself and they find it so comforting when they understand that their doctor mm-hmm. is here to partner with them, not just today, but for the long term, you know, so that actually brings them a lot of comfort to know that I'm not going through this myself. And there's a support system, there's a care team, and that there's always something to to look forward to. So find that next thing to look forward to, whether it's learning a new skill, or finding a way to regain that functional ability that they lost whether it's driving or walking or simply making it to the bathroom, some, sometimes just helping them make those small goals and giving them that little bit of hope can can be a can make a profound difference. So to answer your question, I guess I try to find that specific individual like goal for each person, which is very different, but it's it's just re- instilling that sense of hope again. I think it's, I love that. Uh, it's very that part helpful. is so cool, Doctor Ben. It is such an <laughs> honor to have you on today. And thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's great. Anything, but thank you. I, I learned so much. And it's just this newfound love and passion for people around me, and especially uh, more of our other population. And uh, it has felt so cool. Thank you so much for joining me in today's episode. Yeah, I hope it was helpful for people who come through and um i i hope that i was able to answer some of your questions i'm happy to answer questions offline if you have interest in geriatric medicine how, what the training is like what to anticipate uh, after training what life is like as a, an attending um it's uh, a lot lots to talk about yes and this is totally not the last time we will talk we'll have more to talk about yeah. Tom, thank you so much totally. for spending time with me to talk about all of this I hope you have a great rest of the night. Thank you.